Hayden from uh, South Cal uh, Southern California. We got the screen up. How are you? We're we're doing well. We're just in the final stage of getting this thing organized here. Uh, Take the time. We are. We're, well, we we are ready, and if everybody else is ready, we are ready to present the panel on transformative justice. This is the first time that the Left Forum is at. John Jay College of Criminal Justice. This is the first time that the forum itself is dealing with the theme of transformative justice. And this is the first panel that will be dealing with that issue from a political, economic, spiritual, and economic perspective. My name is Jim Vredos. I'm a sociologist here at John Jay College. And I'm so grateful and glad that you're all here for this significant panel discussion on what we hope will be a turning point, a very historical moment in the struggle to bring about a just and humane world. Now, we have Tom Hayden, as you can see, Skyping us from Southern California, and uh, Fania Davis will be along in just about a half hour. She's actually probably crossing the bridge now into San Francisco, or from San Francisco, Oakland, and she'll be here in about a half hour. So. At least for an hour and a half or so, we will have a merger politically of Southern California and Northern California. So uh, thank you, Tom, and, and thank you, Fania, for that. We also have Carl Hart, who uh, has just flown in from Texas and graciously has been able to make it uh, for our panel. And Mortal Technique, Felipe Cornell, is with us as well. So we've got a terrific, wonderful panel uh, I will be up here just for a few minutes, setting the tone, setting the structure for what we're going to be talking about here. So bear with me. Uh, we'll have the panelists here in just a few minutes uh, talking. But I wanted to open up this panel by emphasizing the fact that the left, the radical left, is vigorously questioning the specter of America's past, of dysfunctionality, of destructiveness. And it's questioning it most poignantly in the criminal justice system, because perhaps nowhere do we see the struggle going on other than that American criminal justice system. Nowhere do we see more clearly the role of progressives, the role that they can play in transforming America. They have been in the forefront of the struggle, and every single member of this panel has been in the forefront as well. So the progressive left needs to offer a coherent narrative and vision of what this world, of what this criminal justice system could look like. The hardline perspective has their act together. Their fears are plain. Their aim is to get them before they get us. It's a fear-based paradigm. Punishment and the threat of punishment are not just its tools, they also arise from a worldview which assumes its own moral, economic, and political superiority. It depends and creates a scapegoat population. And you all know the statistics. This is what we've been living through the last 40 years. This is what this paradigm has produced. The US murder rate is higher than that of nearly all other developed countries. The United States is one of the world's most heavily armed nation. America has the highest reported crime rate in the world and is the most unsafe country in the world, rated by the top 10 countries with the highest reported crime rate. Almost 2.5 million people find themselves imprisoned in the country. That's a 500% increase from 1980. More than 60% are black and Latino. Almost one out of every 30 American adults is under some form of control in the military, 
industrial prison complex. One in every three young African American men will find themselves in this system. Recidivism rates remain at 70%, and we only have 5% of the population of the world, but yet we have 25% of the world's inmates. It's so obvious this is a broken structure that is causing all kinds of dehumanization and unimaginable human misery. And we turn to the reformers. Uh, the New York Times had a recent editorial about a week ago, and I'm quoting, if there is any remaining disagreement about the destructiveness of the experiment of mass incarceration, it mirrors the so-called debate over climate change. In both cases, overwhelming evidence shows a crisis that threatens society as a whole. In both cases, those who study the correctional system have called for immediate correction. Notice the use of terms, correcting the correctional system. It's not about abolishment. It's not about challenging the system that has produced this structure. It's not about any sort of radical restructuring of the political economic, moral, or intellectual order. The reformers call for what many progressives would consider humane changes, such as reducing sentence lengths, providing more opportunities for rehabilitation inside prison, removing the barriers to keep people from rejoining society, uh, releasing elderly or ill prisoners. Sorry, let me turn that off. Rating prisoners. Uh, sorry, great prisons and their success in keeping former inmates from returning. But you can see these are very piecemeal efforts to deal with a problem that is overwhelming, uh, overwhelmingly vicious and in so many ways needs such a much more transformative view. So we are left with a version, a vision that needs to dramatically be offered to the American people and to the world. And that's what this panel is about. That's what this moment is about. Beginning to realize that the reforms can't get us, uh, get us out of the mess we're in, that the hardline punitive perspective has brought us untold misery. And then for the sake of, of time here, I'm gonna only present 10 proposals. There are numerous others that I'd like you to consider and, and actually I guess Tom has the hundred or so other proposals, and uh, uh, we'll get to that. And, and I know Tom has read this, so uh, he's, he's very glad that I cut it down here a bit. In any case, here are the ten. One, a transformative justice system needs to differentiate itself from both the hardliners and reformers. It should see the traditional criminal justice system as critical to maintaining the old political and economic order. Number two, we need to see the master-slave relationship in corporate America, a plutocracy, an oligarchy of greed and privilege attempting to destroy what is already a limited democracy. Number three, we need to end mass incarceration and the use of punishment in that system in all its forms. Completely, unequivocally, we should think outside the box of punishment to stop the cycle of hate, and violence. Number four would mean the end to the drug war, the decriminalization of drugs, support for voluntary detoxification facilities. Number five, a transformative justice system needs to show our political system has failed to serve the needs of the majority of its people. We need to incorporate what Tom very eloquently expressed in the Port Huron Statement in 1962, participatory democracy. And this would involve the formerly incarcerated and their families mobilizing as beacons of conscience and education for us all concerning the cruel and inhumane system that they've had to live under. It's within the jails of America, the detention centers, the supermax prisons and solitary confinement that America can begin to learn and heal and transform itself. Number six. We also need to see the link between the justice system and a healing and spiritual transformation in the people, emphasizing our common humanity and love for the earth and all its inhabitants. Number seven, we agree with Angela Davis that we need a demilitarization of school, revitalization of education at all levels, a health system that provides free physical and mental care, care for all, and a justice system based on reparation 
and reconciliation rather than retribution and vengeance. Number eight, we agree with Cornel West's call to resurrect the great revolutionary prophetic traditions of all peoples, but particularly the black prophetic tradition within the American experience. Number nine, truth and reconciliation committees need to be established to heal the profound hurts and dysfunctional behavior rampant in American culture. Healing the hurts and shame that we all carry around is at the center of a transformative movement. We need to specify the conditions or variables that can enable love and caring to grow. And 10, since we're here at John Jay College, the academic world needs to tear down the intellectual and moral walls that separate us, the academics, from those that we analyze, compute, document, theorize about, and design policies for. Many don't do this and have opted for a world of comforting illusion. So a transformative world and a transformative justice system would take us out of that illusory world. And as a first step toward that, I'd like to present Dr. Carl Hart, who is the preeminent drug researcher, neuroscientist from Columbia University. <laughs> Book on high price has won overwhelming praise. He's a leader in bringing about the end to the drug war. So Carl, thank you very much for being here. All right. Do I need to have this here? Uh, yeah. Tom, I'd kind of like to take a look. Oh, yeah. So, Tom, <laughs> Tom, you good, man? Are you good, Tom? Here, everything. Okay. I just need to have something here. Are we good? Oh, I'm screwing up your mic, man. I'm sorry about that, bro. Um, so Tom's still here. Good. Uh, and Reverend Phelps is still here. Oh, we good? We no, you cut the line. We cut the line? Yeah. It's still wireless. You broke it. So the cable out. Where is it? Here. Uh oh. We'll get everybody back. All right, we'll just speed up. Jeez. Paul has just returned from Texas, by the way, assuming that you tried to enlighten the, the Texans there on the drug war. All right. We good? We good? Tom, you there? I, he I, I hear you fine. All right. Great. Go ahead. Great. Okay. Thank you all for coming out. I actually didn't know what I was getting into here. Um, <laughs> let, you know, I, quite frankly, I, I kind of get tired of these groups, really, and these sort of discussions. Uh, I've only been doing this about a year now, really, on the road since the book has been published. And then as I think about all of the problems and all of the things that we are trying to change in the country, I am often reminded of the words of James Baldwin when he said that to be Negro and conscious in this country means to be in a rage almost all the time. And that's where I'm at. And so as I, we, I participate in these sort of intellectual masturbation sessions that we have, um, I, I get bored. So please forgive my boredom. Uh, what I'd like to do today is just talk to you all just a little bit about what I do and how it relates to the subjugation of people, not only in this country, but people all around the world. So just briefly, what I do is I study drugs, drugs of abuse, drugs that everybody kind of know about. Cocaine, crack cocaine, methamphetamine, marijuana, heroin, you name it. All of those drugs. If you all are old enough to have been around in the 19, late 1980s, when we passed legislations in this country, I think drug-free communities, drug-free nation, you all, anybody, you all remember that, that legislation? Mm -hmm. And we all kind of went for it, and we all should be embarrassed. We should be embarrassed because there has never been a drug-free society, Sorry. and never will there be a drug-free society, and you don't want to live in a drug-free society. But we passed those legislations, that type of legislation, 
with harsh penalties associated with it. It was unrealistic, but we all went for it. And so when we go for those sorts of things, and we're going for things like this even today, I think that's the major problem. It's not that we're bad people, but our apathy. Our apathy in accepting these sorts of things. And, and that's what we did in terms of the drugs. Because we believed that drugs were destroying the community. Many of us believed drugs were destroying the communities. Turns out it wasn't the drugs. Turns out it was poverty. Turns out it was lack of jobs, turns out it was lack of education, uh, opportunities, and so forth. Turns out it was even racism. And racism, I am discovering, is the biggest problem that I see in the country. But then it turns out Americans don't even know what racism is. They don't know what racial discrimination is. We just had an example, for example, in this city with stop and frisk. We, had a we have a policy that deleteriously impacts a racial group, a selective racial group, black and brown people. That's called racial discrimination. And people who support that policy and defend that policy, we call them racist, even if they don't wear white sheets or even if they don't call somebody a nigger. We still call them racists. But we, don't, we didn't seem to do that with Mayor Bloomberg and those people who support that policy. They are racists. That's the 21st century racist. As I look around the country, as I look in our workplaces, even this place, and I think about who are in these spaces, who are your professors at my university, all of these universities, these workplaces in the United States? Black and brown people are not there. We have systematic racial discrimination going on that we are not calling out. And if we want to actually do something in terms of changing how our society treats people, that's where we start. We start in our racially segregated workplaces. Because as long as you have our racially segregated workplaces, we, have, we allow people to be apathetic to the plight of, of folks that we care about. In my spaces, for example, where I'm at, many of us, we determine what you think about drugs and how you view drugs. Many of the, the people in those spaces are not black and brown people. So when we see all of these negative effects from the policies, people are apathetic. They don't, they don't really care because they don't affect their community because these workplaces are not reflective of the people who are being punished in these spaces. But what's worse is that as I travel around the world, our views about drugs and our drug policies are being exported. I just returned from Brazil. Brazil has the largest African population outside of Africa. 51% of the population is African. Less than 5% of African people participate are elected officials in that country. You go to their universities. Black people are absent, conspicuously absent, in all areas of mainstream. And they now have what they think is a crack problem. And they've now passed new legislations to deal with their crack problem. So it's 1986, 1988 in that country again, because they're modeling what we did in this country with crack and our laws. But if you go all around the world, you see the same sort of thing. And the people who are being deleteriously and negatively impacted are those people of color. The people who are conspicuously different. And so as I think about what I can do in this effort, one of the things that I'm trying to do so I can manage my rage, one of the things that I'm trying to do is to help people to see how they were misled in my area of expertise. 
That's what it is. So I'm trying not to get too broad because as I get too broad, I move outside of my area of expertise. My area of expertise are drugs. And so there are some things that we have been told about drugs that are just simply not true. We've been told that drugs are so addictive. It's not true. The majority of the people who use drugs are not addicted. They go to work, they pay their taxes, they're just like the last three occupants of the White House. All of those guys use drugs. Bill Clinton, marijuana, George Bush, marijuana, widely suspected of using cocaine. Barack Obama used cocaine. Not to disperse their reputation at anything, but all of those guys are responsible individuals. That's the typical drug user. We think about the effects of drugs on the brain and the body. Again, we've been misled and, and we've been lied to. So, as I, as I think about all of these things, I, I don't have the time to really go into these things in any depth because this is a panel and I don't usually do panels, quite frankly, because I don't have the time. But I would encourage you all to read anything that I've written. You don't have to pay for the book, but just read something in the public domain. If you read something in the public domain, you'll see how, you, how we've been misled and how drug, the issue of drugs and how the issue of drug policy has been used to further marginalize marginalized people. So as I think about this whole incarceration concern that we have, and I think about the war on drugs and it's played a major role in that. That's not the real problem because once we once we all understand how we've been manipulated with drugs, that will change. And then it will shift to something else. Something else will be the tool that is used to marginalize people. So that's why I really encourage you all to look at your workplaces. Look in mainstream America and see if black and brown people are there. If they are not there, it's on you to call people out. Because if you don't call people out, why are you here? And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jim. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Carl. What we're going to be doing here is having each of the panelists talk for about 10, 15 minutes or so, then uh, have some interaction between us, the panelists, and then open it up to you and the audience for, for questions, because I know you're going to be having so many. Um, we are, without further ado, let me just put on a mortal technique, the greatest hip hop artist of our generation, the philosophical poet of our time. How's that? Way too much. No, not enough. <laughs> I'd like to thank all of you for coming. I'd like to thank all the panelists, Reynolds, Dr. Hart, that beacon of excitement that you are to this conversation. But what's interesting is that even though my colleague speaks uh, in a reserved manner, the things that he writes about and the things that he say jump out of the page. Um, when we talk about transformative justice, when we talk about uh, criminalizing people, I know that we use certain language to talk about. We use the word offender a lot instead of calling a person an actual human being. And I feel like my prison experience, my experience on parole, has taught me something else, that we need to amend that term. It's not just offender. It's offender who doesn't have millions of dollars to get himself off the case because when he does, he's not an offender anymore. The whole mold and idea that they came to the inner city with when I was a child of, oh, we need to catch all the little fish so we can get the big fish. Well, here's the problem. The big fish has that $10 million attorney, and all the little fish make less money than the guy working at McDonald's. Unfortunately, what this creates is a case where people think that they want to reintroduce the youth into society. Now, that term is completely useless of reintroducing someone into society 
because how can you reintroduce an individual into society that's never been part of society? How can you take someone that's never voted, never paid taxes, never attended school, never got a degree, never understood how to pay a mortgage, balance a budget, and you're gonna tell me that you're gonna take this person who's been completely dependent on the state, a legal means of slavery, by the way, in order to run their life. Unfortunately, this is the disinformation campaign that people have to deal with on a regular basis. Um, the writings that I do and, and the music that I make deals with youth incarceration a lot. It deals with the ideology that people who are running around the street right now, they're not looking for fortune, ladies and gentlemen, because they know there's no fortune in the street. They're not looking for fame. They know there's no fame in the street either. They're looking for the most unlikely thing that you would ever think they would be, whether it's a gang member or a, 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 a wild cowboy from the ghetto. They're not looking to, to be immortalized in a, in a story. They're looking for love. And I'm gonna say that again because it seems ridiculous for me to say, but it's the God's honest truth. Someone willing to fight 20 other people because they're wearing blue and he's wearing red, that's not out of the need to prove anything to anybody. There's no camera on. You're not in front of Hollywood. You're doing that because you love the brothers that you came up out of the dirt with. That's, you're doing that because you love the people that you have around you because you've grown in camaraderie with them. And all gangs, unfortunately, have a lost revolutionary past because people from the days of old got together and said, well, let's talk about how America's really structured. You know, the difference between black and Latino immigrants and the European immigrants that came has a stark difference. And why? It's because we've been fed this mythology that people from Italy or from Greece or from parts of Eastern Europe came here and just pulled themselves up by their bootstraps. Why can't y'all niggas do the same thing? How come you Latino people can't get it together? Well, here's the difference, ladies and gentlemen, that when people first came to the country in the early 1900s or before that, when illegal immigration first started in 1492, I think that it's important for us to know that a lot of, a lot of people uh, had not just applied for citizenship, but they also applied for whiteness. And that plays in to the racism that the doctor was discussing before. In other words, if you did not apply for whiteness, you could not uh, join a union, which is incredibly important, as we all know, for working class Americans to protect themselves and their job from a predatory employer. Um, they weren't allowed to join the police department or the fire department. They weren't allowed to get loans from the bank, so they were locked into a red line district. So as you see, certain immigrants have a different experience than others. Also, for a long time, up until I believe the 1970s, CUNY was free. So there's another additive asset that people have had in their favor, that people have advantages they don't even understand. I think, obviously, we have to take a little time to use that wonderful Republican phrase, personal responsibility, and decide what does it actually mean for us? Are we personally responsible not just to ourselves? We're also personally responsible for other people in the community. We're also personally responsible for the forces that govern that community not just for the, the people in the hood or the people in a well-to-do area, we're responsible for the police department that governs that area. I was on a panel discussion, I mean, I, I've done so many of them that I, I've grown accustomed to the, 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 I think someone called it mental masturbation. I don't know how many people you need until it's a mental circle jerk, but I think that at some point we have to acknowledge that there are so many different aspects and dimensions to this fight that just attacking it from one perspective will not work. And I'll use the example of colonization of people to show you how. Everyone has always told me since the civil rights generation, oh, we're gonna fight against racism and classism. Once some people think racism is the end all be all, some people think classism facilitates racism. What is a broke racist, the powerless individual? What is a rich racist, the definition of racism because they have control over your life. In other words, there's no such thing as reverse racism, it's just racism. The difference is that some people have power behind their racism and some people have no power. Some people have the power to make fun of someone who can't dance. Is that racist? Well, yes. Does it have any power? No. Someone says, hey, you can't have a job and the difference is you have to justify that you're a human being. That's something that the other side of racism has never done. Yes, people have made fun of people for, for things that are ethnic stereotypes. But 
Ask yourself, when I've experienced racism, did I ever have to justify my humanity to anybody? Did I ever have to look in the past of my life and say, hey, you know, I'm not three-fifths of a man. I I I'm not a mixture of a man and a monkey. I'm not an individual that mates with a person and we create a mulatto, which is a Latin term for a mule. What is the benefit of this term? It creates the idea that the European would exemplify the horse, the standard of being of a human being, a human being that actually eats better than a human, and the person of color would exemplify the donkey, the combination of these two creatures being the mule, the unholy alliance, they called it, what classical Hollywood cinema is based off uh, the history of the tragic mulatto, that figure that nothing good can come of all this, of course, because the mule is born impotent. Now, why do I point all of this out? Why all of this history? To understand the foundation and the roots of how racism got involved into our society. Other people didn't need the excuse of racism to do what they needed to do. The early Greeks and Romans conquered so many people, whether it was the Scythians, whether they went to Judea. They didn't need to make excuses to the Hebrew people. Oh, you're less than us, you're gods. Are less. No, we beat you. You're a slave, you'll get used to it. These are the new gods you'll worship now. We'll have a bunch of revolutions to work it out and then you'll get used to the way things are. That was the way the caliphate operated. That was the way Greek states operated. That was the way Middle Age Europe operated. It was only America that needed to make these excuses for racism a scientific excuse, ne let us never forget. A religious excuse, never let us forget. Were all of these things that facilitated a, 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 a sort of double standard of treatment within a justice system. Why? I'll get to that at the very end. But the point is that to facilitate a double standard of this justice system, you do something to a people that you normally wouldn't need to. In other words, if they had simply said, I took you because I had the power to do so, the way the Romans did, then there would have been not the cancer that we experience now. It was because they injected that lie that after slavery was then removed from the system or at least relegated to an amendment of the Constitution that punished people with slavery for breaking a crime, they would have not been accompanied with all of the aftertaste of that. In the very beginning, you see the early Greeks and Romans did not have the cancer of racism that their ancestors would then absorb. They had African popes, African emperors of Rome. I think these things are, are ripped out of history because of La Reconquista, which is, of course, the Christian crusade in Spain, where they decided, no, we don't just want to get rid of dark people. We want to paint over the Christian saints. We want to get rid of all the Muslim people in Spain. We want to get rid of all the Jewish people in Spain. That's where the Alhambra degree comes in. And why? Why, ladies and gentlemen, all this? I'll explain it with a very simple metaphor that some of you will get, and maybe some of you that aren't into sci-fi won't get. There's a, a new movie for Star Wars coming out. How many people have ever seen Star Wars? Please raise your hand. All right. Y'all older heads love Star Wars. Is there nothing wrong with that? <laughs> You can admit it. Come out the closet. You love Star Wars. No, no, I don't judge you. There's a, 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 a second movie for Star Wars called The Empire Strikes Back, a fitting title. And towards the end of the movie, he says, we're going to put this guy into carbon freeze. And he goes, that could kill him. And he goes, all right. Well, then I want this machine tested on Captain Solo first. I don't want the Emperor's prize damaged. That's what they're doing now. They're testing the machine because you, ladies and gentlemen, the establishment of America, the middle class, the upper middle class, the lower upper class, you're the prize, ladies and gentlemen. Us, the people that are seen as less desirable by society, those individuals that people are used to seeing downtrodden, even those individuals that we find irreconcilable with our morality, for example, child molester. I've been to prison. Nobody has patience for that. Nobody has patience to sit there and let a person that had sex with children breathe in the next cell into them. So we created this thing that we look at as selective morality. And this is what allows us, and this is the cancer that you've been injected with as well. 
because you say, well, fine, these people are murderers and they touch children as well. Let's take away whatever privileges they have in prison, never thinking that the next person could be you that they do this to. All these FEMA camps we hear people screaming about on TV, oh, you're all gonna be sent to a FEMA camp. You know what I mean? Uh, the guy seems to have an orgasm in his pants on Fox whenever they start screaming about FEMA camps. You know who's in those detention centers and camps? Immigrants. Why? Because in those people's minds, they think, I don't belong there, but those people belong there. Criminals, immigrants, people who are powerless in society, poor people. I tell them we divide ourselves by race in prison, because that's true. But we're all united by class. Why? Because if any of us had that $10 million lawyer, we wouldn't be sitting there in prison. Which always begs the question from some cynic in the crowd, <coughs> Well, what happens, Technique, when you find a millionaire in prison? Well, then he's the guiltiest motherfucker in prison because he had a $10 million lawyer and not even that guy could get him off. Use logic and reason, ladies and gentlemen. We don't have to pull the soul out of revolution. People are, are, are united by their ability to make money off this system. We're divided by petty differences between Sino-Soviet disputes we're still arguing about 40, 50, 60 years later. They got together and reconciled their differences and said, no, this is something we're gonna call a government. But we all know it's a fraud because a government doesn't exist. It's just people that rule over other people and they created a wonderful little system that will take their place when they die. Therefore, I don't have to teach my kid how to run this shit because you've already been set up with the system in itself. The question is, what can we do about it? We talked about challenging things the moment we see them. Not just challenging things on the outside, but challenging things on the inside is how you change the world, ladies and gentlemen. And you start, of course, like the doctor said, with the people around you. Although I would say, focus on your family first. You know, if, if I've learned anything it's that individuals that are the closest to you are the people that we can't seem to reform. We have all these issues and we talk about the human rights of all these other countries in the world, and yet who are our biggest partners politically, militarily, wherever they are in the Middle East or in Latin America, these are the worst human rights abusers. We can't stop them from doing what they're doing. Why? Because we're helping them do what they do because we send our garbage there when it needs to be taken out, because someone sends that person to a black site and you think, oh, fanatical Muslim terrorist, that's where he belongs, but you don't understand. He's in carbon freeze. He's waiting for you to stand there next to him because one day it'll be, you know what? You shouldn't speak against the system. You should have this sort of thought and idea. And every society has gone through it if you look very closely the Romans went through it when their republic collapsed. There was a revolution intended years before, and Cicero had the, the, the conspirators killed without a trial. Open the door. Japanese imperial government, why did they go to war with America? Their military took over. They, they had a thing called the toko, where they literally were a thought police. I know people are, are, are going for a, cr a criminal degree here. You want to reform the system. You want to do something about it. Don't end up being thought police. We don't need thought police. We need people to police the police. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, we need to get yeah. We need to get Fania Davis in, uh, and then Tom will be our next speaker. Uh, just to do a, a brief little plug here, I uh, did a fabulous interview with uh, Tech uh, last night, actually, and will be on Progressive Radio Network this Monday, 8 p.m. Just Google Progressive Radio Network. You can hear the interview we did with uh, Moral Technique on the radio show. I do ra uh, the Rebbe, the Radical, and the Rev. And, and this is the Rev right here. I'm not the Rebbe, so uh, I guess I'm the Radical. Um, and by the way, Fania Davis has also been interviewed. Uh, you can look up that show. I think she was on a month or two ago. Carl was on a couple of months ago. And, and actually, Tom was on. I think he was one of the first ones on the show. So it's about time for him to come back. Um, but in any case, uh, 
Are we ready with Fania, or are we... Yeah, I've never... Maybe somebody knows how to do, bring a second person in. I've not done that before. So we're, 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 we're looking for how to do trying that. Trying to get our second Skype person in. Uh, somebody probably knows how to do that. Do we have somebody from tech here? Uh, not tech, right. but uh, from technical service? Stuff? Okay, here we go. Oh, here we go. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, while we're doing that, why don't I introduce... Someone who needs no introduction, of course. Uh, Tom mm -hmm. Hayden uh, wrote the Port Huron Statement, which, which laid the foundation for the new left in the 60s, Students for Democratic Society. He is now the former director, he is the founder and present director of the Peace and Justice Resource Center in uh, Culver City, uh, California. So thank you so very much, Tom, for being here. We'd love to hear your comments uh, about the possibility of a transformative justice system. Well, thanks very much. I hope uh, everybody can hear me. I'm picking up a text with something's on your end. Uh, Jim? Well, yeah, let's hold on here. Um, can somebody. You guys get... need a younger person? I can send somebody out. <laughs> <laughs> We'll get we'll get this straightened out in just Double a second. Double click the screen. Double click biz. I'm sorry. Double click. Add to group call. Add to group call. Add to group call. Add to group call. The green thing. Right. I did that once. There we go. Nothing happened. Okay. Um, okay. Just hold on for one second. Uh, let me get. Hmm. Let's get Tom back at least. Well, I'm here. Okay, well, let's. All right. However, everything I say is echo. Mute, mute your mic. Okay. Do you hear the echo that I just talked to? Mute his mic. No. Mute your mic. In the computer? That mic? Yeah. See if that. What? Is that muting our mic, or did we lose him? Did you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Jim, the good people at J.E. College. I have benefited from several business with John Jay over the years. Uh, uh, I did a lot of research on my book, uh, Street Wars, based on good work done by John Jay uh, scholars and community activists. Um, they led me to do many interviews at Rikers Island, um, and uh, I think they've been a, uh, a very important uh, center for discussion about the criminal justice system and uh, reform, repair, um, uh, transformation, whatever we, we, we might want to call it. Um, I, and I want to thank the previous speakers, both of whom were just great. I really, I, I was really glad to hear you. I, I have one uh, uh, sort of uh, critical comment. I wanted to defend, uh, uh, I hope this doesn't offend anybody, but I wanted to defend masturbation. <laughs> I, I hope I'm not misunderstood, but without intellectual ferment and argument, uh, uh, I'm not sure where we would be. Uh, nobody is born with revolutionary thoughts, as far as I know. It takes a lot of time to begin to uh, separate oneself from an existing worldview and begin to create a whole, a whole new uh, worldview. It's a long process. It obviously involves work on the ground, concrete work, listening, interviewing, uh, location, location, location. Uh, one has to be uh, uh, among the people that one is trying to uh, understand, write about, and advocate for. Uh, and I think. Uh, a lot of good work has come from that. I, I want to. Uh, uh, I'm just looking at my shelf. Uh, 
besides the books that have been mentioned, the um, Michelle Alexander book, I think that the Jim Gilligan book on violence is a, is a basic uh, starting point for uh, any of you who are reading and, and trying to figure all this out. Philippe Bourgeois' book, In Search of uh, Respect, on the uh, tract issue in uh, El Barrio, uh, way back to way back, Henry Thomas's book, uh, all the way up to uh, Jeff Tank's wonderful book on hip hop and gang, uh, Can't Stop, Won't Stop. Uh, tremendous book by Terry Cooper is called Prison Madness Upon Solitary Confinement. Uh, uh, some of the work at, that came out of John Jay by Dave Brotherton and Father uh, Luis Barrios. Uh, the almighty uh, Latin king and queen nation. Uh, there's a hundred books uh, like that that need to be read as we go about our daily practice, our everyday work. Uh, and uh, uh, <clears throat> that, of course, is not masturbation, uh, except of the most um, interesting uh, kind. So that's uh, the first thing I wanted to say. Uh, Second thing is the uh, uh, transformation, which Jim is trying to uh, get us to focus on, is not a uh, concept where over here uh, we're on one, one side of the world and on the other side is the promised land. Uh, uh, transformation is a daily process that sometimes occurs uh, invisibly is hard to detect unless you're listening very, very carefully. Uh, and if we if we don't understand that we're in, we're actually in the middle of a transformation, uh, uh, we'll be uh, we'll be stranded. Uh, we are in the middle of a transformation, and I'll try to explain that. Um, we've gone from certain ideas, certain movements, and groups that were on the extreme margins and moved gradually towards a mainstream consideration, uh, made some reform achievements, uh, and what happens then, the tremendous blast from the opposition, a counter-movement, uh, some call it a backlash, uh, and then you're in, you're, you're in very turbulent waters, and there are very tough questions every day about how to hold on to what we've achieved and, and avoid uh, blown, blown back by the Tea Party, the, uh, the extreme right, uh, and, and what kind of decisions will allow you to complete the transformation. Also, I think transformations take about 100 years. They don't take 100 days. Um, typically, um, for instance, from the, the discussion of Reconstruction to the beginning of the modern civil rights movement was about 90 or 100 years. The achievement of the right to vote for women uh, was uh, about 100 years of continuous struggle. During those 100 years, the people there at the beginning are dead at the end. The people who succeed uh, were born long after the struggle started. The organizations that did the work uh, usually have a life expectancy. They're very energetic, catalytic, uh, militant organizations, a life expectancy of about seven years. Uh, and so, so it is hard to comprehend the whole process of transformation. Now, let me, uh, let me uh, say one other thing to be specific and to go back to the, the discussion. Uh, sitting in LA, uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting to visit and uh, look at Bjork with the uh, rise of uh, Mayor de Blasio, the rise of the movement against um, Stop and Frit, uh, tremendous struggles carried out. And then the appointment of William Brett one more time as your chief of police. Uh, many people, including progressives in Los Angeles, uh, won't say it, but they're quite glad Brett left town. <laughs> Uh, he he's a hard he's a hard person to deal with because uh, he has a huge public relations machinery in the spectrum of American law enforcement. He's definitely the more liberal end of the spectrum, 
either because of hard experience or uh, for, for, other, for other reasons. Um, and he was brought into Los Angeles uh, for a very specific purpose, to help the LAPD get out from under uh, the federal government uh, because of the consent decree that was imposed uh, years ago. Uh, and he left uh, uh, for New York after he thought that he succeeded with the consent decree. Before the consent decree, we had three decades violent friction between the African American community, the Latino community, some of the white liberals, uh, and the LAPD. The LAPD was, by its own description, an occupied a thin blue line defending the middle class, upper class against the uh, upper class. Uh, uh, the inventors of SWAT teams, um, the kind of department that brought to global attention uh, Daryl Gates. Um, it was a war zone in uh, uh, many areas of South Los Angeles. There were many reports by uh, uh, well-meaning uh, liberal think tanks. Uh, very useful information was developed. Forms were called for. None happened. People at the highest level, future secretary of state, future directors of the CIA were brought in to uh, direct reform conditions, co uh, 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 coalitions, nothing happened. Uh, what did happen was that uh, Al Sharpton, your town, was in a meeting back when, uh, just when Clinton was come to office. And Clinton was proposing this huge um, uh, militaristic uh, Democratic alternative to Republican militarism. The centerpiece was 100,000 police on the streets, which Clinton knew that Republicans would want to pay for, but Democrats would. So in the meeting about the, the uh, huge uh, buildup, uh, uh, Sharpton got really angry and went off uh, against the uh, what he considered correctly the overly uh, uh, reactionary thrust of the packet. And as a concession to uh, uh, Sharpton, Bill Clinton included a, a line in the bill, otherwise bad bill, that allowed the Justice Department to intervene uh, whenever it detect a pattern practice of police misconduct that violated Constitution of the United States. That that led uh, to federal intervention in Los Angeles when a civil rights attorney locally, Bill Van Lee, was co-opted into the uh, process, and he brought a, a case using pattern and practice, would have gone to a jury and would have exposed all of the terrible secrets of the LAPD. Uh, an alternative city finally negotiated a, a consent decree with the ACLU and others. Uh, and, and Bratton put in to be the administrator because he was already working in the private sector on the same issue. He was then brought in uh, to head up the LAPD and, and went forward. Long story short, uh, the result of that reform, uh, and I, I say reform intentionally because uh, it seems to be a bad word in this forum, but I think it's, it's an inevitable problematic phase of transformation, really. Uh, the outcome of the reform, which took almost a 10-year period, was number one, the most important, was that Opinion surveys showed that people of color, in particular uh, LA's African American community, tremendously appreciated the reform and the new face of the LAPD. Um, so a base was built in the very community that was most critical of the uh, of the LAPD, a base for some sort of reform. Secondly, uh, uh, there there were there were a lot of uh, uh, new forms of training, new forms of recruitment, 
Um, uh, we found that even having a majority of the police force being officers of color, Latin American, African American, Asian American, uh, did not make that much of a, a difference. It was a more systemic uh, problem rated in, uh, rooted in the exact issues that the other speakers have, have mentioned. Uh, what was going on was a police buildup, more law and order tactics, a categorical demonization of youth of color at the same time that you had an economic divest from the city. All the factories that previously hired uh, ex-prisoners for working class jobs were disappearing to Central America, to Mexico, no the stories. There was a coupling of militarization on the one hand, deindustrialization, the very beginning of globalization took place locally in Los Angeles. Um, and the, the result of a significant reform on the police side, but no reform on the development side. There was literally no new investment in the areas that the people burned to the ground where the mass uh, dislocations had taken place. The most that could be said is that a kind of uh, uh, gentrification policy uh, based in the market dynamics took place. Uh, and yet, gang violence went down. A lot of the homies of the value viewed a lot of the street gangs uh, came to the conclusion that it was really genocidal to killing each other, killing themselves, and secondly, no one would help them. Individuals, maybe, a priest here, uh, a rabbi there, a lawyer here, a politician there, but they had to invent a process of redemption and transformation on their own. That was called the uh, gang peace process, which had two components of uh, uh, prevention of uh, the, the uh, virus of uh, violence, but also what was really radical and new was intervention, which was a fancy term for allowing gang members and ex-gang members uh, uh, to engage in a conflict resolution process to try to channel their disputes uh, in a more constructive outcome. Uh, and the, you know, the killings did go down. They're, they're, they're still significant, but they went down by more than half uh, over that period of time. A uh, breath that left, uh, and he left behind a police department that considered reform. He had such a good reputation that he was recommended by Attorney Connie Rice and many others for the job in New York under de Blasio. I wrote several memos to members of the uh, de Blasio administration and to my friends Center for Constitutional Rights and other lawyers in New York saying, keep your eyes very carefully open. Perhaps may be the person for you to reform the uh, New York Police Department. He may have his own agendas. Uh, he he uh, was pushed to do what he did in Los Angeles. He has conflicts of interest in the private sector. If you choose him, choose him because you think he will implement the reform of uh, Stop the Trips and soon be out of town on the, his next uh, journey to London or Washington, D.C. But what you should know, and I'm repeating it here, is that according to a Harvard study commissioned by Bratton, there was no reduction in Stop the Trips during the reform of the Los Angeles Police Department. If you look at the pedestrian stops, if you look at the stops uh, in automobiles uh, in the inner city of Los Angeles during those years, you're talking about 600,000, 700,000, 800,000, 900,000 individual stops per year by the LAPD. Uh, what happened was a lessening of overt discrimination against middle class people of color an appointment of, uh, for ministers to boards and commissions, 
uh, an improvement of the police commission oversight process. But the underlying concept that you have to control the underclass, that youth per se, 18 year olds per se, are inherently dangerous. They have to be contained, they have to be controlled, even if they have not committed a crime. A form of preventive detention out of the streets has to take place. That was never litigated. Uh, that was never uh, resolved. We are left with that. And I'll leave you with uh, uh, the thought that that means there is a ticking time bomb in Los Angeles, as there may be in the future in New York. Uh, and what happened to the civil rights community, especially the civil liberties lawyers who fought so hard, is that I, it's fair to say that as the process of reform of the police department went on, the opposition community largely disappeared. Some of them now work for the police department. One has a car in the parking lot of the LAPD. Uh, they are so wedded to the completion of the uh, consent decree at this point, they don't recognize some ominous uh, legacy and I'll leave you with this image. Just this last two months, the Inspector General of the LAPD, a good man, uh, reported that half the officers, the foot officers, the beat officers, the speed officers, had ripped off the little canvas and the antennas that they were forced to wear in order to photograph their interaction with people they were stopping on the street or asking to get out of their cars. That was an act of total insubordination of civilian authority uh, and the police chief and the police commission and the city council. So far as I know, they've gotten away with it. So reform was successful. There's no going back to the old LAPD, but reform definitely has its limits uh, and as long as we don't deal with the problem, the economic, social, and racial problem of the underclass, as long as we don't deal with 40% of people born in Los Angeles poor, uh, we are only creating the conditions for some new um, insurrectionist uh, or, or rebellious uh, cycle in which people will be scratching their head saying, how did this happen? We thought we reformed the system, and I'm say, saying this as a, a warning to you in hopes that you get it straight, take it further in New York City. Mm -hmm. God bless you. We're gonna we're gonna try and do that, Tom. Thank you so much. Um, we're gonna now try to get Fania Davis on uh, as well. And why don't we, while we're waiting for that, which hopefully won't take too many minutes here, uh, those of you who have questions for Carl, for Tech, uh, for Tom, uh, we have uh, some mics here that you could come on up. Are there any questions for the audience right now? Yes, sir. Well, it's just a comment. Okay. Um, I live up in the Boston area. Yesterday, Michael Bloomberg gave the commencement speech at Harvard, and the whole thrust of his speech was, how we all have to be against repression. It was really remarkable. Yeah. I'll leave you with that. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Carl, yes. Okay. My comrade from the Stop and Frisk movement who's now involved in another movement, Stopping Mass Incarceration. All right. My name is Carl Dix, and uh, representative of the Revolutionary Communist Party. And I want to say a couple things. I do want to make an announcement, but before I get to the announcement, Look, people need to want to get rid of this criminal injustice system. All the horrors that people were talking about, the war on drugs, the mass incarceration, add to that the police terror and the criminalization of the youth. People should want to fight that and want to do something about it. But here's a hard truth. Reform and or revolution, if you limit yourself to reforms, we will end up with another version of this. Maybe tweaked a little bit, or maybe even worse, because there are forces in England for even worse things on this front in this society. 
It's going to take revolution, nothing less, to get rid of the criminal injustice system and the capitalist imperialist system that's responsible for it. Because when you look at this program of criminalization, it is actually the result of the actual way this capitalist system works and conscious policies like the crack cocaine disparity, like the war on drugs, taken by the people who run this country to keep their setup in effect. That's very important as we go on this. And I'm going to be speaking at other panels where I'm going to get more in depth on this point of how the criminal injustice system and its horrors are built into the fabric of this capitalist system and what it will take to get rid of it. But let me just say this. The revolution is real. It is here. We're building a movement for revolution. We've got leadership. We've got a strategy. And people should check that out. And part of that strategy is something we call fighting the power and transforming the people for revolution. Actually fighting the way the system comes down on people. And through the course of that, bringing people to see the source of the problems and the solution in revolution. And this brings me up to my announcement because it's that approach that led me to join with Cornell West to propose a month of resistance to mass incarceration for October of this year. Uh, we held a strategy session actually here at John Jay in April. This month of resistance is being developed and built. It's going to be a month of very forms of resistance, coordinated nationwide demonstrations cultural expressions, ferment in churches, mosques, and synagogues, panels and symposiums on college campuses, and other forms of resistance, all targeting the criminal injustice system. Resistance that will involve and mobilize thousands and tens of thousands of people and impact the way millions of people look at the question of the criminal injustice system and all its consequences. So that's what we're going to be doing, and everybody here who wants to see this stuff stop needs to get connected with it. You can get connected with it online by going to the website stopmassincarceration.net and just talk to me here. Thank you, Carl. Thank you. Okay. Other Thank you. <laughs> questions for our panelists? Jim had to step out. He'll be right back. So questions for our panelists? Come down the line with the mic. Okay, we've got a mic that can amplify you too. I don't see any right now. Do I, am I missing anybody? Oh, okay, up here in black. Come on. One yeah. master data. Got another one? Yeah. Uh, uh, should I come back to the mic? Yes. Okay. Is Tom still on? Yeah, I'm trying to get this whole weekend out. Yeah, Tom yeah. is going to be accepting the Skype call to be on in a couple minutes or so. Uh, okay. Yes, sorry, go ahead. Uh, you know the expression, a conservative is a liberal who's been mugged? I'm a leftist who's been mugged, assaulted, burglarized. I know women who've been raped. I know a couple people who got murdered. And I think the one thing that really gets forgotten in a lot of the discourse about crime is that the people who are most likely to be victims are people who are poor, working class, black, Latino, live in those in poor neighborhoods. So the question is, you know, how can you deal with crime without replicating the injustice of the prison industrial complex? I think, where's the mic? It doesn't work. Uh, I think we should maybe let those people in those communities speak for themselves on that issue uh, when we worry about crime and that sort of thing. I, I think that one of the things that happens in those communities is that the only sort of public services that they can get are the police, and that's what they call for. And so I think we should maybe allow them to think about what they need and want in those communities. I mean, so you're saying who's likely to be a victim of crime? Maybe we need to ask them what, what they think would be the solution. I've written about drugs you know, for 25 years. I interviewed you a couple of years. Can I try to, uh, can I try to answer? I can't tell if everybody is there. We can hear you. We're all here. We can hear you. We can hear you, Tom. And, and Fania uh, should be there as well. Tell me if I might say a word. Uh, uh, let me just finish by saying. Okay. 
I found that, you know, I wrote about the Rockefeller laws, and people are violently ambivalent about it. You know, they don't want, you know, drug dealing and gang war in their community, but they also don't want, you know, the cops coming in and jacking up every man between the ages of 14 and 25. Well, maybe if those men between the ages of 14 and 25 or whatever had jobs, and we yeah. talked about jobs as opposed to this sort of focus on violence. Uh, and and I, have, I have a comment about Tom's remarks about academic masturbation in terms of people needing to understand what the problems are. I don't know if people who are being negatively impacted need to study it for all those years to know that something needs to be done like academics do. The problem with academics, and I'm one, is that they talk about things and then they think that they've done something for the problem. Yeah, absolutely. Um, oh yeah, sorry, sorry. I comment. Well, he was saying, uh, just one second, technically. No, just the, the people that are, that are victims in this situation, unfortunately, aren't only being victimized by other criminals in their neighborhood. Because more than black on black crime, more than Latino on Latino crime, we have a, a crime that's done within an area of proximity, right? So we have proximity crime in, in a vein. People aren't gonna drive a hundred, gang, gang violence, when's the last time you heard of gang? Hey, we're gonna carpool for 200 miles and we gonna get these motherfuckers and then they're gonna realize you don't fuck with San Antonio. You know, dude, you're from El Paso. What are you doing? That's eight hours away. At the same time, these people that are victims of their own neighborhood and proximity violence become a victim twice in this area. And I think that this is best exemplified by the poor people that are caught in a third world sort of guerrilla struggle, which is unfortunately what the people in a rural, or, or sorry, in an urbanized community here find themselves in. They're victims of the government when they come by, when they say, well, give me the names of, of people that have been here. Give me the names of people. We're gonna torture you, burn your village, rape your women until you give me the name. Right? Then they leave, then the guerrillas come back. And they say, well, you've conspired and colluded with the government, so we're gonna burn your crops, rape your women, burn down your village in the same fashion. The question is, can we offer us something besides the most negative counter effects to what we do? Is it jobs, is it a positive effect? And at the same time, academia isn't just masturbation, it has the power to influence policy, it has the power to influence young people's minds. It's, it's just a lackadaisical giant sometimes. When it starts moving, then the force of it finally hits something with the impact of a train. But without it being actually in motion, it's inert. So I think that's what we were discussing. Thank you. Okay, and, and Tom, just a brief comment, and then we're going to get right to Fania. Did you want yeah. to comment on that? Yes, I do. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I was afraid my humorous <laughs> reference to masturbation would not be received humorously. Um, <laughs> but I, wa I wanted to uh, answer the gentleman who said, uh, what do you do um, uh, about actual crime? And what I've been struck by over the years in Los Angeles is um, such a simple answer that people in the community want actual criminals uh, arrested, detained, put on trial if necessary, serve time. That's kind of the basic consensus. But they do not want and do not believe it's necessary to search and frisk uh, in, a, in a brutal way, to arrest people in a brutal way, to cuff them when they're down, uh, uh, and to run them through a criminal justice system it's like a kangaroo court and put them in prisons where their situation gets worse. And the, prop, the issue for the police is, we have to ask, how systematic is this? That it is impossible uh, to get the police to change their behavior uh, towards crime on the street or in the prison. They don't seem able, they think that they're being pressured by the ACLU or or um, Dix's Revolutionary Communist Party to, to lay off the, the street justice that these hoodlums deserve. It's, it's absolutely entrenched in the culture of policing, and that's why the transformation is gradual. And I do think uh, the idea of bringing the community in, uh, uh, the way we have drug courts sometimes work in Los Angeles, 
is a useful idea until the police uh, uh, grow up. Okay, Fania, thank you so much for hanging on with us here. We're sorry for the all the technical problems. So this is Fania Davis now, uh, one of the leading uh, advocates of restorative justice, uh, talking about her program in Oakland, California, working with youth in restorative justice. Thank you, Fania. You're welcome. Uh, good afternoon. I guess there it's evening. Um, I feel a little sort of out of sorts, having not been able to hear what other panelists have said and what the questions have been uh, from the audience until now. Um, but why don't I just sort of pick up from the comment of the, uh, of the last person who spoke. Uh, for the last two days, we have actually been training police officers uh, in restorative justice in Oakland. Um, and these are what they call problem-solving officers who have a neighborhood beat and these are also officers who were assigned to schools. Um, we have already done a lot of work in schools. Um, our joy, my organization, has a sort of two-tiered strategy. We not only provide services to youth who are in conflict, we not only do peacemaking circles or healing circles or talking circles, uh, with the youth at the school site, we do uh, circles as an alternative to suspension, uh, circles to uh, reduce racial disparity in exclusionary school discipline. Um, but we also do youth police healing circles. We've done those kinds of circles in schools. Um, say, for example, at one of our schools, there was clearly a lot of tension between uh, the students and the police officers assigned to the campus. And so the restorative justice coordinator and our joy employee, my organization has a staff member there, uh, decided to do a circle uh, with police and youth, sort of a relationship building circle. So uh, they all got together, about five or six police officers from Oakland Police Department and about 10 or so youth. And uh, they basically got to know each other and the students got to ask questions like, why is the response time so late for our communities? Or why do we see you guys joking and laughing at the scene of murders? Um, officers to that last question responded, well, it's our way of handling extreme trauma, which we see every day. And they had a discussion about it, and the kids accepted that. Mm. Um, and they basically got to see one another uh, and, and go beyond uh, their perceptions and assumptions and stereotypes of one another. Uh, after the circle, they decided that they would play basketball together. So the school team beat the police team, and uh, relations are much, much better. On this particular campus, we've completely eliminated violence, even though it's a campus for youth who are juvenile justice involved. Um, so there's a lot of work going on in Oakland and what we are trying to do is, is to create the world that we want to see. We are not just saying, we're not just protesting, we're not just fighting against racial disparity in exclusionary school discipline. Um, we're not just fighting against low graduation rates of African American students in particular, but we are creating programs and creating pilot pilots and, 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 and uh, successful pilots and, and programs that are, are, that are transforming school culture um, and really making a difference. So the, the work with the police sort of grew out of the work that we're doing at schools. Uh, we, we've been doing this work for uh, some years now, for, for six or so years. Uh, so I just wanted to touch on the work that we're doing with police because we are seeing a culture shift even amongst the police with this restorative justice, justice work that we're doing. It's just beginning. Um, I, I want to just uh, address some of the overall, the overarching themes of conference. I know reform and revolution is an issue. Whenever I hear those two words juxtapose, is it reform or is it revolution? Uh, I think of a, a personal story. I'm Angela Davis's sister, and many of you probably know that Angela was uh, on trial for her life back in 1970 and 71. 
uh, on capital charges for murdering judge, a judge and, and others in an attempted uh, prison breakout uh, in Marin County, California in August 1970. Um, Angela was arrested. She was captured after a, a nationwide hunt by the FBI. She was on the 10 most wanted list. She was captured and uh, then in New York, and then she was extradited to California. And we decided that we would. <laughs> Okay. okay. All right, we're back again. We're back again. Yeah, well, let's see if this works. So, yes. Okay. Sorry. Sorry again. Uh, yeah. So I don't know where you last heard me, but um, I was trying to talk about the question of reform versus revolution. Mm -hmm. So Angela was incarcerated. We wanted to get her out of jail as quickly as possible. And we certainly wanted her to go on trial as a free woman. So we mounted a mass bail petition campaign. There were people in the movement who disagreed with that and said that that was reformist. We not only want her, we don't just want her out on bail. We need to demand her complete freedom. And they accused us of being reformist. We went forward with the bail petition. We collected tens of thousands of signatures from people all over the country demanding her release on bail. We also got the support of probation officers. The judge, however, denied the bail petition, saying that his hands were tied, that in the state of California, capital offenses such as hers are not bailable. He said he would do it because he saw how much people believed in her, how much support she had, and, and he believed that she would, she would not try and escape, but he just could not do it because the law tied his hands. So she remained incarcerated. However, just a few months later, the law of the state of California changed. The state of California outlawed capital uh, offenses. It outlawed uh, the, the death penalty, basically. So we quickly seized that moment to renew the bail petition. And the judge says, my hands are no longer tied by the law of the state of California. She can go. She is free. So. That's just an example of how, of course, she went on, as, as most of you know, uh, to be freed after a long trial. But there was a lot of debate about reform and revolution surrounding this question of the bail petition. Had we not gathered signatures from hundreds of thousands of people, tens of thousands, rather, across the country, we probably would not have been able to get her out because even though there was a law change, even though the death penalty was outlawed in the state of California, it was only for a week or two. I can't remember the exact time frame. But if we had not already had all those signatures ready and already had that bail motion ready, if we had waited, even delayed two or three weeks, we would have lost the opportunity to free her. So I think that's just an example of how, as someone said earlier, uh, it's not an either or proposition. And it's important for us to get away from binary, oppositional, either or, good, bad uh, ways of thinking. Anyway, I think those ways of thinking, binary ways that tend to split reality uh, and polarize relationships, uh, is part of our problem. Um, it's part of the reason why we see so much devastation around us today. But. That's on the question of reform and revolution. Also, I want to talk just a little bit about what does this transformed reality look like? What does this social transformation look like? Uh, I understand that that's a, a, a theme 
of this conference? Well, for me, the social transformation that I wanted to see in the world has evolved over time. I um, was born and raised in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, during the 50s, during the time of uh, segregation, strict segregation, uh, during the time of uh, basically apartheid-like conditions in the South, I was born and raised in a place called Dynamite Hill. That was the neighborhood that we lived in. And it was called that because our family was one of a few black families that moved into a previously all-white neighborhood. Um, and we were met with racial violence to frighten us away. Um, and of course, Birmingham's nickname is Bombingham. So these were the kind of conditions that I grew up in. A uh, culture, too, where the social messaging, the pervasive social messaging, was that you are subhuman because you're black. You are less intelligent because you're black. You don't deserve to go to the amusement park as a child because you're black. You don't deserve to have parks and swimming pools and movie theaters because you're black. That's reserved for whites only. Um, so coming out of, out of those kinds of conditions, and I, I suppose probably the most... Um, critical uh, single factor that uh, made, makes me who I am today is that two of my closest friends were killed in the Birmingham Sunday School bombing in September of 1963. And so as a child, I was a civil rights activist. When I left the South, uh, I became a nationalist um, in, in the Black Power Movement. I became a womanist in the feminist movement. I became an internationalist, uh, uh, fighting for uh, peoples who were struggling for their national liberation all over the world. Uh, I became a socialist um, and a peace activist. I became involved in almost every movement that you can think of uh, coming out of the South on the sort of quest for social transformation. And my ideas about what social transformation looked like evolved and expanded as I moved from movement to movement. When I left the South and went north, where I personally experienced discrimination against me, although more subtle, the hunger for freedom from my people in the South became a hunger for all my people north and south. So for me then, social transformation meant a world free of hierarchies of racialized social control, not just legal segregation in the South, but second-class citizenship in the North. And then when I became um, a, an internationalist, social transformation for me meant freedom, uh, well, it meant victory, first of all, the national yoke of colonialism and neo-colonialism. And then when I became a womanist, social transformation meant a world free of women's oppression. And then when I became a socialist, social transformation meant for me freedom for the working class and all oppressed peoples. So coming from the South, I really sort of evolved my notion of what freedom meant, what justice meant and what a uh, socially transformed world mean for me. And then I became a civil rights lawyer. Uh, so for 30 years I was involved uh, in all of these movements. I was a litigator fighting against racism um, in every possible way. And then after about 30 years of this intense activism, 20 of those as a civil rights litigator, I reached a point where I became really out of balance. Uh, from the hyper-masculinist, hyper-rational, hyper-aggressive uh, and bellicose personal qualities that I had, to I had to cultivate, whether as a litigator or an activist. I literally became ill. I was so out of balance. I kind of intuitively knew that I needed an infusion of spiritual and creative and feminine energies uh, and healing energies to move back into wholeness, to move back into balance. That's what I need. So I, through serendipitous occurrences, I ended up shutting down my law practice, 
entering a PhD program in indigenous studies and going off to Africa where I apprenticed with a Zulu traditional healer. And with it, this healer and others, and in this PhD program, I learned about indigenous ways of knowing and being. And my notion of freedom and social transformation continued to evolve. I came to realize that the ultimate cause of the pervasive human alienation and degradation and of the ecological devastation imperiling our world was not just racism, sexism, imperialism, capitalism. These crises are themselves manifold manifestations of our modernist worldview. And I came to understand that the historical imperative of our times is not solely to change the complexion of those in power from white to black or any other color, and I think we're learning that today with our experience with, with the current presidents. It is not just to, to change the gender of those in power, nor even just the class of those in power. I came to understand through my work with healers that if we are to have a future, that we would need to reinvent what it means to be human. If I am, I am in the morning, I am in the evening. Oh, this is Oh, 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 oh,